Good Sabbath, everyone. There we go. So good to be back with you again. I missed you last week. If you would, this morning, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Go ahead and place your marker there, for that's our text for the day. We continue this week in our series entitled, Commandments of Jesus. Now this series is based on the directive we were given in John chapter 14 and verse 15, that if we love Him, keep His commandments. It was such a big deal that Jesus repeated it three more times in the 14th and 15th chapters. And he even impressed the Apostle John to repeat it three more times in his epistles. Now understand that keeping the commandments of Jesus does not save us. Keeping them doesn't make us better than other people. Keeping the commandments of Jesus is simply loving obedience to the one who saved us from our sins. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Beloved, we are called to obey Jesus' commandments out of love. And we are promised that when we do, we will be loved by both the Father and Jesus more and more. So if we agree that we are to keep the commandments of Jesus, one thing remains. You have to know what those commandments are in order to keep them out of love. So it's to this end that we have devoted a large part of the messages in 2015 to learning and understanding the commandments of Jesus. Previously, we've covered Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, which is dealing with Christ's command to repent, as well as Matthew 4, 19, dealing with Christ's command to follow Him. And today we move on to Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 through 12 where Jesus commands us to rejoice when we are persecuted for his sake. Now before we go into that passage, I have a question to ask, and I don't want to answer. This is just for you to be thinking. Who here wants a reward from God today? And it's easy to raise your hand, but just hold your horses. Hold that thought, and let's read the passage. (laughs) Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. And say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now if we take this passage and we break it down. We see that Jesus gives us a key to being blessed. We all want to be blessed, right? Well he said one of the ways and times when you're blessed... Is when people attack you with scornful or abusive language and treat you cruelly, possibly to the point of torture. Hmm. Well, Matthew Henry explains it this way. He said they are blessed. For it's an honor to them. It's an opportunity of glorifying Christ. Of doing good. And of experiencing special comforts and visits of grace. And tokens of his presence. You see, in light of all that Christ did for us, enduring just a small portion of the persecution that he who didn't deserve it, but endured it on our behalf, what an honor that is. Yes, it's an honor to experience persecution in the light of all the persecution and suffering Christ endured on our behalf. And you see, it's when we look at it from that correct perspective, it's amazing to think that we could be blessed with the opportunity to give glory to God this way, by being persecuted. Now, it's entirely possible, not having been there, but as I considered this verse, it's entirely possible that the folks that were listening to Jesus see say this, didn't see what he was saying there, because of course he hadn't died yet, but if you just listen to it on the surface, it might be that some of the folks at the time there were thinking or muttering to themselves, so if I choose to follow you, I should expect to receive the blessing of people attacking me with scornful or abuseful language and treating me cruelly or unmercifully? 
possibly even to the point of torture? Wow, if that's a blessing, I don't want to be cursed. Do you? Man, that's rough. Who is this guy anyway? I mean, think about it. On the surface, what he said makes no sense. But he doesn't stop there. Then Jesus tells them to celebrate when this blessing occurs to them. Not just to be thankful, but to rejoice. And not just be glad, but be, the Bible says, exceedingly glad. Unbelievably glad. Unreasonably glad. More glad than the situation could ever call for. Well, again, I try to picture those folks sitting there listening to Jesus saying that, going to say, what? You want me to celebrate and shout for joy when that happens? What kind of a crazy idea is that? Yet Jesus continues, he goes on to explain that when we do what he asks, when we rejoice in the midst of persecution, he says, and I quote, great is your reward in heaven. In other words, when this verbal and physical attack on us because we follow Jesus, when that occurs, Almighty God takes notice and speaks to an angel and says, set aside a reward for that person. Not just any reward, but a reward that in the eyes of the Son of God, He described it as a great reward. So I ask you again, who here wants a reward from God today? Now the hands didn't go up quite so fast, did they? Maybe not so eager to raise your hand when you know the price of the blessing. But let's finish analyzing the passage. Jesus also tells them why this is expected to occur. He tells them this persecution, this is nothing new. This is what happened to the men that God sent to prophesy to Israel. People didn't want to hear what God had to say, and they killed the prophets for saying it. And so Jesus is telling them, look, if they persecuted those who came before you for bringing my message to them, they're going to persecute you as well. So don't be surprised, but instead rejoice and be overflowing with gladness because God is not only going to reward you, but He's going to greatly reward you in heaven. Now you say, Pastor, I thought we were studying the commands of Jesus here. Well, we are. Because He sets up the scenario first. He said, blessed is He who's persecuted for my name's sake. And then He gives the command. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Now, oh, if you feel like it, or if you want to, or if you want to blow their minds, or rejoice and be exceeding glad when you're persecuted for Jesus' sake, whether it's for preaching the gospel in the street or simply for being identified as a follower of Christ. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Jesus, notice Jesus isn't saying here that persecution might happen. He said when it happens. We can conclude then that it is an expectation of followers of Christ that persecution will happen. He's telling them positively it will happen and gives us a command here of how we're to react when said persecution occurs. Pretty radical thought, isn't it? Not just A, those of us here in America are going to endure persecution at some point, but B, when it happens, we're supposed to be happy. Not just a little happy, but like I won the lottery happy. I can't help but wonder how many nominal Christians today if they grasp that concept that this is a part of walking with God, would immediately get up out of church and leave never to come back. So wait a minute. All the pastor told me is I had to come up here and tell everybody that I'm a sinner and ask Jesus to save me. I ain't got to do nothing else. Not so. You see, the very Son of God Himself 
is telling us not only that persecution is and will be a part of our walk with him, but to not be downcast or troubled by it, but instead to be like Stephen in Acts and rejoice and praise God to be used in such a way to be a witness for him, knowing that we will be greatly rewarded in heaven for doing so. And again, he didn't say if you feel like being exceedingly glad. He didn't say if you want to blow your tormentor's minds. Man, that dude's crazy. Look, he's celebrating. We're beating him up and everything. He's just shouting. Jesus said, instead, act like you just won a million dollars. Because he states clearly and unequivocally, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Brothers and sisters, this is Jesus' command to us today. When, not if, when we are persecuted, shout hallelujah. Thank God. Praise the Lord. In fact, make folks think you just won the lottery. Wait a minute. You did just win the lottery. Because remember, Jesus said that God will not only reward you, but He will give you a great reward in heaven. It's not just a hundred bucks. It's all the riches in heaven. Woohoo! Because if God says the reward is great, if God says the reward is great, and think of what He thinks is great compared to what our finite minds can... Like, what in the world is it? My curiosity drives me... So what? what, what is it? In fact, I always figured that if I were to make it to heaven... That'd just be reward enough, you know. Because I don't deserve anything. But if through God's sacrifice of His Son, His death and resurrection, and the grace and mercy that He shows me every day, I'm blessed enough to be able to step inside heaven's pearly gates, I figure that's reward enough. A reward I don't deserve. And yet, God loves us so much that that's not all He has in store for us. He said, I don't only have rewards for you, but if you rejoice and be exceeding glad when this happens, there is a great reward for you. He says, celebrate. Shout for joy. Praise God. Go bananas, if you will. Why? Because again, we have an effect, just won the greatest lottery in the universe. The apostles, they encountered the blessing of persecution right after the incident with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. You want to turn there, you're welcome to. But we find here in Acts chapter 5 that God was working so many miracles through the apostles that folks were flocking to them. The verse, one of the verses in there says that people were lining the streets just so Peter's shadow would fall on them and they would be healed. This was causing a commotion in the city. I was talking, I think, with Brenda last night about this and said, imagine if they'd had the media capability today, back then, what a commotion this would be. If CNN and Fox and all these other networks said, there's a man over there in Jerusalem, and when he walks by, his very shadow heals people when it touches them. You don't think the tickets for planes and trains and boats wouldn't be going through the roof? Everybody with so much as a sniffle would be heading that way. Well, that's what was happening. Word had went out, and people were coming in and lining in the streets. And they weren't just healing people, they were telling them about Jesus Christ and the work that He did on the cross. Now the religious leaders of the day, they didn't want that brought up. Remember who it was that actually sent Jesus to the Romans to be crucified? The ones who shouted from the crowd, crucify Him, crucify Him. These are the folks that are angry. Make those guys be quiet. So they sent some officers to arrest the apostles. Not just Peter, but the scripture says the apostles, all of them. And put them in jail. 
God wasn't having none of that, so he sends an angel and lets him out of jail. Says, go back and keep doing what you were doing. Next morning, the religious leaders look, hey, I thought we locked those guys up. Here they are preaching again, healing people again. So they arrested them again and brought them in front of them. The Bible says that it, they beat them and commanded them not to speak about Jesus anymore. I do believe this is the persecution that Jesus was talking about, don't you? But what is so cool is that the apostles remembered this command of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, 11 and 12. They remembered that. Because in verse 41 we find that they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. Did you catch that? They left the place after having been jailed, beaten, chewed out. They weren't depressed and downcast. They weren't questioning God's presence or lack thereof in the situation. The Bible says they were rejoicing. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for using me for your glory and honor. I'm so thankful to get beaten up and chewed out for your name. You see, they lived out this passage. They showed their love for God by rejoicing when they were persecuted for Jesus' name's sake. Now we could also look at a famous book titled Fox's Book of Martyrs. Many of you have probably heard of that. And find story after story of people who, when even being burned at the stake, died as they were praised, singing praises to God. And we can find many there who have lived between the apostles' time and here today who experienced suffering and persecution and even death for the cause of Christ. Each one rejoicing for the opportunity to do so. But instead, let's look at an example that's happening today, right here in our generation. How many of you have heard of this American currently suffering for Christ with joy? Pastor Saeed Abednedi. He's an American pastor who today, right now, while you're sitting in the chair in this warm chapel, is serving an eight-year sentence in one of Iran's toughest prisons. Why? Simply for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ at an orphanage. He's a 34-year-old pastor, father, and husband from Idaho. He's currently in prison in Rajay Shar prison. He was formerly in Evan prison. But on July 28, 2012, during a visit to Tehran to visit his extended family and to finalize the board members for the orphanage he was building in Iran, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard detained him, asserting that he must face criminal charges for his Christian faith. After some intense interrogation, he was placed under house arrest and told to wait for a court summons. And then on the 26th of September in 2012, instead of receiving a summons telling him where to appear, five members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard raided his parents' home in Tehran, confiscated many of his belongings, and took him to an unknown location. And then after four days of not knowing whether he was alive or not, his family heard that he was in solitary confinement in the notorious Evan prison. Now throughout his imprisonment, he spent several weeks in solitary confinement. And was only brought out of his small cell to be subjected to very abusive interrogations. He has been allowed visitation by his family that's in Tehran, but he has not been allowed to have his wife and two children who live in Idaho come visit him. They have not seen him since 2012. He's been denied medical treatment for infections that have resulted from the beatings that he's received. And while he was in the Evan prison, the ward doctor and nurse refused to treat him because as a Christian, he was considered unclean and an infidel. In early 2013, it became known to the world that Saeed was suffering from internal injuries and doctors determined that his injuries warranted immediate attention and in their medical opinion, he deserved to be treated in a non-prison hospital. So for almost a year, the Iranian regime ignored this advice until March 2014 when he was permitted to enter a private hospital for treatment. 
But after only two months in the hospital, he was returned to the prison without having given one single surgery that was deemed necessary by the hospital doctors. We don't know what they are. Some think it may have been a ruptured spleen, pierced bowels. They've really treated him terribly. Yet through this entire terrible situation that's happening right here, right now, while you're listening to me, Pastor Say continues to write encouraging letters. He wrote this last Easter a message from his hospital room, a message about his Christian faith in Iran, crucifying the resurrected self with Christ and resurrecting our death faith with Christ. He says, Happy Resurrection Day. On the eve of Good Friday and Easter, I was praying for my hospital room for my fellow Christians in the world. Now you would think in this situation, his prayers would be anything but for other people. He goes on to say, When the Holy Spirit revealed to me in prayer that there are many dead faiths in the midst of Christians today, that Christians all over the world are not able to fully reach their spiritual potential that has been given to them as a gift by God, so that in reaching that potential, the curtain can be removed and the glory of God can be revealed. Writing this from his bed in the hospital. Sometimes we want to experience the glory and resurrection of Jesus without experiencing the death with him. What we don't realize is that unless we pass through the path of death with Christ, we're not able to experience resurrection with Christ. We want to have a good and successful marriage, career, education, and family life, which is also God's desire and plan for our life. But with Christ, and to die to ourselves and selfish desires, this is why Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. This means that we should not do the things that we like to do that God doesn't want us to do and to do things we don't like to do but God wants us to do. Why? So that He may be glorified. Who better to preach that to us than Pastor Saeed? So in addition to spending our days and nights and doing the works of faith described above, we should also transform our death faiths into living and active faith through the resurrection of Christ, which is an active and constructive love that is effective. In conclusion, let us resurrect our dead faith to living faith by first dying to our selfish, resurrected self and experience fully the cross of Jesus. Then and only then are we able to experience the glorious resurrection with Christ. A glorious life with Christ starts only after painful death to self with Christ. Amazing, isn't it? Here's a man living out Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Now many of us may not even know what slight ridicule for being a Christian is. And that may be because we live in America with such rich, and rich Christian heritage and religious freedom. Or it may be because we have lived a life of death faith. A life that both in word and deed, people don't have a clue that we even know who Jesus is. You see, folks, here's the thing. If we learn and we do the commandments Jesus told us to do this year, it will set us apart from everyone here on this earth. Even those who only profess Jesus, but don't follow Him. You see, this is not an anomaly either. The writer of Hebrews talks about the people of faith who went before us, who considered themselves what? Strangers and pilgrims. They didn't want to fit in. They knew they had a home on high. And just like strangers, as Christians, we should stand out in a crowd. People should see a difference in our actions, our words, and even our countenance. Folks, this is what Jesus is commanding us today. 
Don't be afraid or downcast when persecution comes. But instead shout hallelujah and thank God for the great reward we have in heaven as a result. Bottom line, persecution is a part of following Christ. When it happens, don't run from it, but embrace it with joy, knowing that a great reward in heaven awaits. Don't just embrace it with joy, but embrace it with exceeding joy. That is the commandment Jesus gives us in this passage today. Keeping this commandment is how we show our love for Christ. Now that we know this commandment, we must commit it to our memory and make plans that when we have an opportunity, just as Pastor Saeed, that when we're persecuted, we can show the world our love for God through our response to said persecution. Next week, we'll continue this series looking at Jesus' commands as it's found in Matthew 5.16. May God bless and lead you until we meet again. Amen.